Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to this morning's lecture. Invited later by Professor Muli Lahat, who is a specialist from Israel and the founder and president of the International Stress Prevention Center, where for over 40 years, together with his team, he has been supporting people in crisis, experienced by various types of traumatic situations, traffic accidents, natural disasters, or war. So we are very privileged to have him here today at the Maria Grzegorzewska University. Uh, he has been with us for the last few months, providing training, trained the trainer for specialists who deal with trauma. We are very grateful for the opportunity to cooperate uh, in this program. And today we will have a pleasure to listen uh, to a lecture built on the experience of Professor Moli Lahad. So welcome, Professor. Thank you. And the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you. I'm going to share with you the subject that was picked by uh, some of your professors uh, that thought maybe a new subject for you, which is the concept of community and how you work with communities following crisis. Uh, so my name is uh, Muli Lahad, I'm a professor of psychology and I'm also a drama therapist. You see, when I teach in Greece, they confuse drama with trauma. So I said it's very clearly drama, but I'm also a trauma expert, so it's okay to combine the two. Anyway, um, I'm in this field of trauma business for over maybe around almost 50, not 50 years, but 45, 44 years. And what I'm going to share with you today is our work in communities. But let me just briefly share with you where we are and what is that we are doing around the world. So basically, if you have any idea of the Middle East, uh, our center is just on the border between Israel, Syria, and Lebanon. So you can imagine that we are a live laboratory of how to work in times of crisis because uh, since uh, 1948 and mostly since the 70s this area has been uh, heavily uh, uh, involved in conflicts so we had to start with working there and I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my history in a minute so basically that's where we are and because we are looking into both the national and inter international aspects, we would like to believe that we are there to promote the knowledge and practice of human resilience. And that's very important for me to uh, right away put across because we have a huge department that deals with post-traumatic stress disorder and related anxiety, but for the sake of uh, our, I would say, novel approach was to deal with how do you build resilience. Our clinic is handling 14,000 hours a year. That's about 350 patients every month. So you can see that we are quite heavily into trauma too, but we believe that you have to work and develop something, okay, and develop uh, the abilities of people to recover and to maintain the well being and mental health of communities. So, in the framework of coping with stress and crisis on personal, organizational, and national level. And we develop methods to go from the individual to the family to the community and, of course, to the state. <coughs> Basically, we were established in 1980, originally by the Ministry of Education, but in years to come, we became a national. Uh, 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 center of excellence recognized by many international bodies because we were one of the first if not the first to deal with what is going on after trauma we never come immediately because we don't believe that we can treat anyone that we don't speak their language so we come like here and you make contact with a local organization or department or institution like uh, this university and you collaborate with them and check what is that people need and most of the time they need uh, a lot of work following the immediate crisis because during the crisis there is a lot of mobility of goodwill and resources but with time both the media 
the donors, the governments are less interested. But the process of recovery is much longer than the impact itself, because only after a while people realize what has really happened, what have been changed in my life, what have been ruined, and what are the consequences for long. And then this is the major challenge, I believe, for societies to recover, okay? So um, we are a non-for-profit organization for many years. We have permanent 50 staff on our, uh, on our team, and some of them are therapists, some of them are working in training communities, uh, community leaders, community services like welfare, health, education, and also we're working with the private sector because we believe that resilience is something that every organization should look into in order to maintain their ability to continue to function despite difficulties. And as you can see, we've done so many hours of training around uh, over this uh, 43 years. So just to tell you that we are working around so much, yes. I just told you that we had this year 14,000 hours of face-to-face -face treatment. Uh, we are combining clinical and prevention work, which is very important for us. Even when we do therapy, we are very much focused on people's resources, how to mobilize your resources, how to be aware that you do have strength inside despite whatever happened to you. Uh, we're working a lot with normal population, not only with PTSD, but within the community, within the education system, with people who are, let's say, well-functioning, and at the same time, they are in this, uh, I would say, environment of crisis or difficulties. And uh, we're focusing on empowerment, which is very important for us, and that's why whenever we teach, and what we taught, we're teaching here for the last five sessions already, is to tell people we're giving you tools, we're giving you maps, it's up to you to create your own programs, your own methods, because we don't give you solutions. We give you tools, we give you maps, you'll have to find your own solutions according to your culture, according to your way of living, according to what is more applicable in your culture. So, we have adapted our programs to many subjects, as you can see, and we're working with diverse cultures, uh, mostly the fact that Israel is made of uh, people who came from 70 countries originally, speaking so many languages, we had to be sensitive to cultural issues, but as a result of our international work, we also developed a lot of what we call uh, cultural sensitivity and cultural ability to work with all these uh, different societies. And so just to give you an idea of where we were in the world uh, until recently, and just to say, tell you that not only in Israel, we're working very, very intensively around the world. So let me tell you my personal journey before we go into more clever, so to speak, speech. I started my work in the north of Israel coming for one year volunteer in a town that was bombarded almost weekly uh, from the other side. Um, and kids and families were living in this uh, uh, situation for about 12 years then. And um, I came and I was uh, coming from a very, very, I would say, um, clear, psychoanalytic, psychopathological background. And I was looking for people who are suffering. I actually imagined that there will be lines of people coming to our center to be therapized. And I was amazed to see that this was not the case. There were, of course, people who suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of uh, terrorist infiltration and bombardment and all that. But most people, they function. Uh, I would say, against my, uh, 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 I would say, predictions because of my background. Because you, when you work in mental hospital, you see everyone as someone who needs uh, psychological support or, or help or therapy. And so I started to ask myself, what have I missed in my studies? And I went around and I started asking people a simple question, which I would love you to think for yourself for 30 seconds. When I am facing something difficult, crisis, uh, 
difficulty uh, in, on, a, on a daily basis or a major crisis in my life? What helps me? What do I know that usually helps me? And usually I ask people to write at least five sentences, five answers, five, five items. So they will see what, what can help them. And what we realize when we ask this question already 43 years ago, 45 years ago, we don't know, 44 years ago, we asked it to 300 kids and 400 adults. And as you can imagine, we got thousands of answers because not one person wrote one thing. Now, in 1979-1980, we didn't have uh, PCs with us. Basically, we didn't have any computer in 1980. So we had to sit down, read these thousands of replies, and break our head, what are you doing with all this information? And we came up with a model that we, uh, I'm not going to talk about today so much, but it really gave us an, an insight of what helps people to recover and we call it the basic pH model. Basic pH stands for people who are sharing with us that what helps them is the belief system. Those who share with us their emotional aspects are helping us them, which is the affective one. Uh, some were mentioning most of the time that their social relationship, taking a role, family, etc., which is the social part. The I is, is for those who are using imagination, in, uh, intuition, improvisation, humor, etc. The C, of course, is cognition, problem solving, making priorities, trying to know what's going on, planning. And the pH is for those who are using the body in positive or not so positive, but still they're using their body. Meaningly, they can uh, eat a lot, drink a lot, uh, go to sleep, or being active, doing sports, uh, walking, uh, uh, doing yoga, etc. So, all that you do with your body to help you to uh, to help you, and the focus is on you. It's not judgmental position; it's uh, observational. It helps you to cope. Based on that, we started to do lots and lots of intervention programs because we realized something that nowadays is so common that you have to learn from the masses, what we call uh, the, the 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 accumulation of of experiences and knowledge that we have on the uh, social media. Uh, but in those days, it was completely new idea that you can learn from, uh, from the real people what helps them and not what makes them ill or, or having troubles. And based on that, we developed our models and methods of therapy, encouraging people to re-engage and learn how to develop their own ability to recover. So basically, um, that's what helped us then. And since 1980, after a year, I decided I'll stay there. And we basically established this, what is called the Community Stress Prevention Center, which is the oldest in the world that is dealing with normal people and with communities, not just with mental health cases or with uh, people who are uh, having any other health problems, but with normal population within the population because we believe and the recovery from trauma or from anything is within a healthy environment, a healthy and supportive environment, what we call ecosystem around the one who is suffering. So what is community? The concept of community is defined as a number of ways in the literature. So as many of us know, for anything that is in the psychosocial sciences or humanities, uh, there are so many... Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, definitions. We're using the, the one that is um, used to refer to territorial definition, uh, relation to groups, relation to uh, groups who share the same interests, belief, language or culture. But nowadays, look, this is 1999, nowadays there are many communities that are not at all in the same vicinity because we have so many online communities and they can be from anywhere in the world and from a diverse background, etc. But anyway, the concept of community is probably very important for the human mind because, because we are so vulnerable as an entity. There is no other mammal that is so vulnerable when we look at the odds when we start our journey on this planet. We come here without any uh, ability to protect ourselves, basically. 
we don't have fares, we don't have claws, we, we can't run, we can't find our food to start with, we don't have a shelter. So we had to rely on others. So community and groups around us is not something that is, you know, nice to have, but it's a necessity for our survival. So that's very important to put across right away. So when communities are encountering a disaster, following the initial shock, most people respond this way, logically, recoup their strength and act to save themselves and those close to them. And that we know from all crises and disasters around the world, that the ones who save the most is not the first responders or the professionals, but the neighbors, the next door neighbors are the ones who save most people even in uh, uh, um, natural disasters. Basic direct excessive assistance and the encouragement of natural support system, such as extended family, friends, community, can create significant positive change in coping with the difficult reactions inherent in such events. So why community when we talk about trauma and disasters? Only 10% of the population will suffer from PTSD if you take an overall, I would say, statistics. But it is not the case. There are cases, there are incidents that you have much more than 10%. Um, for instance, from natural disaster, you have less than that. You'll have between 3 and 4%. But from uh, terrorist attack, you may have 30, 40, 50. Rape, 50, 60, 70. If it's in the family, even more so. But when you talk about average, you talk about what? If you took an a, a epidemiologic approach, it's about 10% from a communal uh, incident. So this attempt to measure PTS, which is post-traumatic symptoms, and refer to it as PTSD. That's very, very common. And there is an abuse of the term of PTSD, unfortunately, because people are worried about this concept. Somehow it gained a lot of public uh, attention, the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder. But, and, and many a times the, the, the um, scientists or the professionals are measuring it much before what we know the time that we should measure post-traumatic stress disorder. We should measure post-traumatic stress disorder af only after six weeks and sometimes even longer. But if you do it in the first few days, you get symptoms that looks like post-trauma, but they are basically stress reaction, which are normal reaction because people need to make sense of what have happened to them. And it takes time. Because unfortunately, trauma breaks the fact that we can feel that yesterday predicts tomorrow. And when suddenly yesterday does not predict tomorrow, it takes time for us to grasp what is going on and how do I reorganize myself. So there are some research that refer to 50% and more PTSD, like Norris and all, but most will recover and after six years, there is no much difference between treated and non-treated PTSD. That's very, very interesting. The problem with this uh, statement is that it's true that after six years there is not much of a difference. But can you really see a person suffering for six years until you say, wait six years, it will be okay, wait six years until... Then. And basically it's not that it is becoming better, but because of depression is overtaking the PTSD. Let me explain to you because I'm not sure all of you understand. PTSD is closely related to depression. What happened over the time that the traumatic symptoms are kind of... Does it work? Because sometimes I don't hear myself. Yes, yes. On and yeah, it comes and goes. Maybe I should hold this one. Okay. You hear me better? Great. So... Um, it's like... They got in the same, you know, uh, um, like in the same carriage, but the leading one to start with the post-trauma, the symptoms of post-trauma. But in times, a person become depleted from energy, and most of this very aggressive and irritable, and and uh, uh, I would say um, other types of of, of post-trauma reactions are slowly, slowly diminishing. But depression 
and avoidance become more apparent. So when they said it after six years, the PTSD is over, it's not over for people, it's just taking a different uh, aspect. But truly, some people will, will recover, even if you follow them for six years, they will recover or kind of find a way to live with it. It's important to say that because um, it gives us a, a big question, if that is the case, should we wait six years and let them suffer? Or do we have methods that can help them to recover quicker? And indeed nowadays, I would say since 2000, we have uh, quite good uh, methods to reduce symptomatology. It doesn't say that they will recover completely, but at least they will not suffer from the very serious symptoms that are really, I would say, robbing them from their lives. Okay, so what are we concerned about if this is the background? We are concerned about the 20% of military service personnel returned from Iraq and Afghanistan with post-traumatic stress disorder and major depression. This is the American up-to-date numbers. 1.4 million children in the US have an actively serving parent. So you can see the ripple effect. The, uh, in, uh, to the August 2009 the edition um, sorry, edition of the Archives of General Psychiatry estimated a cost, listen, of $12.5 billion to treat these people. Do you see any country invent, investing $12.5 billion to help people with post-trauma? No. Impossible. Now, this is a very important uh, uh, study that was done by good friends of mine, Rodriguez. I, did, I don't know Dockery, but I know Rodriguez and, and Bootcock. They studied um, major crises and what happened to systems. They basically did a historical overview of all the big pandemics and tragedies that covered many, many thousands of people. And what they came up with is that Look here, at 30% casualties, we are about of full entropy. Uh, what is entropy? Entropy is the uh, noise or inability of a system to maintain its structure. Let's see, at 30%, we're about full entropy. Means you don't have to have the system hampered, destroyed for more than 30% of the staff. And it sounds crazy, it sounds impossible, it sounds unreal, but I can tell you that the above data, okay, uh, has been already confirmed in many cases around the world. Basically, in Hurricane Katrina, this was the evidence that about 30 to 40 percent of the helpers of the system, of the hospitals, due to the floods and the uh, uh, destruction of the hurricane were not functioning and the outcome is still devastating in Mississippi because the recovery is very very slow and we have many examples for that also from Israel. So most strikingly even after a colossal failure of governments and this is very interesting to act the citizens are still looking up for the government as their primary source of support so people despite the fact that they found that the government didn't do anything or failed, they still expect them to do the job. 97% of the population in North Israel were still looking for government and local authorities as their prime support and 91% expected Ministry of Social Welfare to help them following the 2006 major, major collapse of services in the north of Israel in the face of the, first, the, the second Lebanon war. But still they were expecting them to come to help. Afterwards, in 2010, when we did the research, 30% of Americans have not prepared because they think that emergency responders will help them. This is falling in a hurricane. So they, it's not a surprise for them, the weather. It's not a surprise for them that the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Authorities, warning them, telling them where to go, but still, as you can see, 30% are waiting. They will come to support me. They will come to help me. More than 60% expect to rely on emergency responders in the first 72 hours. How come? There is an earthquake, there is a flood, there are bombs. How come they will come? It's impossible to, to expect them, but they still have this notion. They don't think that they have to take care of themselves. Of those who perceive themselves to be prepared, 
only 36% did, uh, did not have a household plan. So almost 40% didn't have any plan, although they knew they have to prepare. And 78 had not con conducted their home evacuation because in the um, southeast of, 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 of United States there are many hurricanes and they should do drills, but they don't. And 58% did not know their community evacuations, even that they were not aware of. And that's following a major, major crisis. So can you imagine it's five years after Hurricane Katrina that devastated the south of, of the United States. 14% of responders report having a physical or other disability that would affect their capacity to respond. So you can see not only the, 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 the citizens, but also the helpers, and so on and so on and so on. So what basically um, is a trouble for us is that people would like to postpone preparing for crisis. It's something they don't want to think about. It's something they don't want to be part of. They would like to think that if they will avoid it, you know, like the monkeys, don't hear, don't see, don't speak, it won't happen. Unfortunately for crisis, the, the rule is the triple A. It can happen to anyone, anywhere, and anytime. And that's very important to remember because they are not mentally ill. It happens to normal people, anywhere, anytime, and any, <laughs> at any moment. Okay, just to show, to show you, this is, let, let's move on from that. Okay, so, conclusion. Governments will never spend 12.5 billion on PTSD treatment, be able to provide direct care or even significant prevention program for 1.4 million children and approximately double or triple the number of the soldiers, other next of kin, that means wives and, and you know, parents. So, we must think community. If you want to prepare for something big, and it doesn't have to be war, it could be a natural crisis, it could be an economic crisis, something that affects not just individuals, we have to think community. There is no other way. Okay, I will just skip that. Okay. COVID actually, uh, I would say, uncovered and made us very, very, I would say, sensitive and aware that community is the main thing. Prior to that, we could think of us as individuals. But suddenly, it wasn't a case of me or you. It was a case of you, me, my family, my neighbors, my city, my uh, um, community uh, grocery, my everything. And so basically what happened is that COVID put the, f the focus on community again. Now, this is, as we know, 220. We started, as I told you, in 1980, okay? So it's 40 years later that our knowledge became so important. And we were, I don't want to, to use the term bombarded, but flooded by requests from all over the world. You have the knowledge of how to work with communities. Please help us, because we don't know what to do with communities. And COVID was and still is, or any pandemic, is a community business. If you don't treat the community, you won't recover. And we all know what happened uh, to, to, to curb this. We had close downs, we had restrictions, we had collapse of systems, education system didn't work, hospitals didn't manage to take all the people that they need to, social services couldn't handle all the requests of the, basically those who were left behind, alone, at home, the elderly, etc. So COVID-19 pandemic directly affected all the sectors. The global economic growth will be subject to at least 1.6 this decline in, this is the prediction for two, two, uh, and, two, and about double that 2021. And we see the repercussions nowadays too. The coronavirus pandemic has negatively affected the communities in many ways. For instance, access to youth work services, shared space and community centers, drug and alcohol services for those who are in need of these services, recycling of waste, dealing with the elderly, impact on education, on local economy, on personal economy. So basically something invisible, 
as we know, <laughs> you don't see the virus, suddenly affected so many, and this invisible little thing causes us all to be fearful of death. The one thing that we all are aware of that is one day we will not be. But we don't want to deal with it. On a daily basis we divert our attention from the fact that we are all vulnerable and we are all transient on this planet. And suddenly, within weeks, we were facing with a question, will I be in danger? Will my family be in danger? Will my kids will be in danger? And that really shutters a very important concept that helps us as human beings to survive. We call it the, the, the concept of continuity. The feeling that despite the fact that I know that one day I will not be, I feel continuous. But when death was the subject everywhere, on the news, everywhere, on anything, and we are all frightened by it, of course it affected both the individual, the family, the community and the state. Other community safety services and partnership work have been severely scaled down, of course, because there were no human uh, uh, force to do it or they were forced to stay home. Community safety issues emerged, emerged such as poor road safety, domestic abuse, elder abuse, mental health concerns, including loneliness and isolation, the creation of more vulnerability and unintentional injuries such as falls. So altogether, the fact that it was not a case of a family or individual made it much larger and affected the concept of how do we manage it as a community. However, which is very important to mention, we are very resourceful animal. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been so, uh, able to survive. And so, just a uh, few items of uh, critical points that we managed to have positive outcome. Like, uh, community safety teams developed to, um, to also deliver crisis services, showing the breadth of skills from community safety, trust in front frontline staff and communities to make decisions, lifting off barriers to innovations and rapid transformative change. In the community, huge volunteering efforts, large number of people stopped or reduced drinking, and flexible workplace that is still, I would say, um, one of the consequences that we are kind of embracing, that you not have to be every day nine to five in your office, you can take it from distant, etc., etc. So there are positive outcomes too, of course. According to UNICEF, 98.5 of the worldwide uh, student population is affected from the closure of education hubs in around 186 countries. In total, 60% of the children learning loss is observed in the least educated countries and families. That those who are anyway weaker, are becoming even more weaker, or became more weaker. It was assumed that the closure of education institutions may help in preventing the spread of coronavirus, but the outcome didn't really show that this was so helpful. It was only 2 to 4% uh, reduction. So maybe in hindsight we shouldn't have closed them? We don't know. Some medium priorities are following the, the, the coronavirus, an increase in referrals around child neglect and abuse. There is a mounting demand for mental health for kids. I can tell you that in my center, the policy was 72 hours wait list. Two months now, because we are flooded with requests. Uh, vulnerable adults and domestic violence, unfortunately, raised. Crime increasing, of course. The need of, to understand the experience of those who are seldom heard because suddenly you have uh, been faced with, with small communities or small groups that nowadays they have a voice but we haven't listened to them for so many years. Making the case of community safety teams and partnering working as well as localization and community participation in service design. One of the big questions from the economical point of view came, why did they close the local groceries and only left the big uh, uh, supermarkets open? When basically the local groceries were with small, pe with small amount of people and the big supermarkets brought hundreds of them in, in one space. 
And the question is that there was no much of thinking of how do you manage such a crisis because basically people didn't have any experience of running a major crisis for so long. Most governments and individuals believe that within one or one and a half months it will over. Then they said, okay, not maybe three, four months. But basically we didn't think that it will be a long term and for that you have to have a different plan not the one that is um, looking at the incident as a short distance running, but as a mountain climbing. Longer term priorities include mental health and trauma arising from pandemic, uh, the impact of deep recession on community safety issues and public services, and need to ensure that the duty of public services is not rolled back on the back of amazing community voluntary efforts, and I would like to, to say that, very important. In every crisis, there are groups, NGOs, volunteers that stand up and do an amazing job. But once government and, and other officials come in, they dismantle them, they dismiss them, they're not, empowered, they're not professionals. This is a great mistake. Build on those who rise to the occasion, connect with them and uh, strengthen them because they will be there for a long time and they will make the community a better place to live in, not any service that comes from the outside. Ensuring prevention becomes our collective focus once again. So that's a kind of a diagram that showed the interconnection between all these different aspects and tells you basically this is not a case for one organization. This is not a case for one service. It is a concept of creating this connection, connection between the various aspects, health, social community context, neighborhoods, education, economic safety, social uh, determinants of health. All these are becoming so important when we think of a community. And it's unfortunately not a very common subject to talk about because community work always looked as, oh, not the most pre prestigious in the mental health services. So let's go to the community as a resource. What do we know from, st from studies? Protection provided by social resources. One of the very important things is social embeddedness, the size, activeness and closeness of the survivor's network is related strongly and consistently to his or her mental health. We are, as I said, a kind of a creature that without its immediate environment, that is family and friends and others, will not be able to survive. We kind of, uh, in, in uh, postmodern societies, think that all is, is with me. I have some money, I have my own car, I have my own flat. Forget about it. Just remember, COVID broke this assumption that I can do for myself alone. And so, basically, when something bad happens, we really need people. I can tell you a story. I was working in Mexico many years ago after a major earthquake in Mexico City. So they asked people to live there. There are only high-rise buildings of 40, 50 stories. And they put in the park tents. And people said, this is the first time I know the person who lives two doors away from my flat. And suddenly it was so nice, he said. I, I can speak with them, I know them, they're so lovely. Maybe I don't want to go to my flat now that I know these people. Of course they went back to their flats. But the sense of Suddenly I have someone that I can speak to. I'm not going into my little hole, close the door, watch the telly, sit on, the, uh, on, on my computer and believe that this is the world. I uh, uh, and so this is very, it was very exciting to me to, 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 to notice that because they were all very, very well off people. This was a very uh, a high level, high standard community. Protection afforded by social resources. It seems like that received social support is the actual helping behavior that emerges in response to crisis. Perceived support is very important. Listen, I don't know how much of you know what's the difference between perceived and actual, but perceived is my belief. And it seems like that when you're, then you believe that you will be able to make it, you are far more predicted to make it. 
then when you are disheartened, say, well, I don't have any, or no one will come to help, whatever. This is very interesting. Um, in recent times, with, you know that less, uh, lately there was a major earthquake in Turkey. What did we, we found, I was working there in 1999 in the big earthquake. What we found out that people who did not, sorry, it's my phone, never mind. Somebody's calling me, I don't, it's my, my bag, never mind. <laughs> Just to tell you that my phone is working, you know. <laughs> Important to know that. So, uh, what we found out that survivors who, I would say, from medical point of view, shouldn't have, of, 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 or have survived, when they were interviewed, they said, I was sure someone will come to save me. This is a perceived belief that there will be someone to come and support, okay? So, um, it protects and uh, replenish other resources such as perceived social support. You really expect this and hopefully you won't be disheartened. Families and friends are relied upon more often and that's very important not to separate. Unfortunately, as you know, in Ukraine nowadays, they do separate. They send the kids and, and mothers here and they leave the men there. And that's, by the way, the reason why we came here to work because all my studies show that refugees have much more symptoms than those who stay behind. There are very interesting reasons for that. When you are far away from your loved ones that you left behind and you don't have enough information, you're all the time worried about them. When you see the news, as you know, news are only focusing on crisis and trauma. So you think that everything is devastated and you can't get hold of who is there. And what happened, you also have guilt feelings that you are in a safe place and they are suffering. And so all my studies show that refugees have much more symptoms. It is not to say that it is not good to save them out of the bombardments and, and war, but we need to know that psychologically it's not the best solution. And when you kind of split families, it's even uh, make it more difficult, I should say. Sometimes this is the only option, but I'm saying to, that we will understand there is a need to support these people because they are, of course, in a safe haven, but that is not making their mind in safe haven, okay? So, uh, when we are planning in Israel cases like this, we usually would like, if at all, to evacuate the whole family, even if they will be displaced somewhere, but at least they will have their immediate next of kins with them. Emotional, informational, and tangible help are all important to affect public. That means if people feel that these services are available, they feel better. By the way, this study was done on 60 thousand people, not on in the, uh, a small community. Community focused interventions for enhancing social resources will vary, of course, depending upon the crisis, the setting, and of course the culture. You see, for instance, there was a case when I was working in India following a major flood, and uh, everyone from the world, they send them these uh, tents that are very good for alpines, you know, because they are uh, very warm and they keep you insulated. But in India, it was so hot, they couldn't use these tents. So you have to think where you send these things, okay? Uh, because an insulated tent for, for minus 40 is not good for a place with 35 uh, uh, centigrades with humidity of about 90%. They actually couldn't stay inside. So basically, when you think about it, you need to think about the environment, the culture, etc. Okay, general recommendations are as follows. Keep people in their natural groups provide social activities. Don't make them passive. I was working in a refugee camp many years ago in uh, Yugoslavia. And what we realized, that people were very passive. And when you're passive, all the bad things that you have inside are surfacing. You become depressed, you become aggressive, you become dependent, you are all the time demanding. And that's very easy for organizations and, and government to control. You'll have a management, you'll, but these are not armies, these are normal citizens. You have to keep them working, you have to keep them functioning. Otherwise, they will become more and more dependent and with more and more emotional and interpersonal troubles. Okay, what helps? There are, there are several studies that showed us what people told us that is helping them. Calling a friend, praying and relying, relying on religion, humor, 
avoiding the media, not being bombarded by horrific sights, use some of the, you know, use painkillers, okay, alcohol and cigarettes, unfortunately, humor, too, too slow, too low, and trusting the government warning, okay? So, I'm telling you like 2,000 years back in time to Confucius who said, we cannot prevent the birds of sorrow from hovering above our head. We can only prevent them from building nests in our hair. How is that connected to resiliency? The concept that we developed called islands of resilience to, I would say, slow down or to, um, yeah, slow down the, the, the effect of the uh, systemic entropy. Now, what does it mean, islands of resilience? You see, you can't train everyone. Let's take a normal school, okay? You have like, what, 100 teachers? If you train 10 of them, and each of them knows about five or six, you're already getting to the majority of the teachers. So you train 10 and make them what we call islands of resilience. They have the knowledge, they have the skills, they have the methods, and so they can help the other, each of them, other six or so on. And so very soon, most of the staff, 10 plus 60, 70 out of 100, are in a way connected to abilities rather than to disabilities. So Islands of Resilience is a concept that we built for communities in Israel. We call it also Community Resilience Center. It's not a big place. It's a small place that is connecting all the services, training them to their, together, creating between the local, different local governments and, 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 and communities shared language. So when something bad happens, they can communicate between themselves, mobilize resources from one place to another. I'll give you one incident, one example. We're living in the north of Israel. It's a very, very sensitive place for earthquake. It's on the Syrian-African rift. We have quite a few agricultural settlements, but we have cities. In the cities, we have mental health professionals, we have health systems, we have uh, all sorts of this kind of support. But we don't have uh, machineries if something bad happens. So we can support the agricultural communities with social services, with, with health service. They, if something bad happens, can bring their machinery to help dig out and rescue people from the rebels. You understand the concept? So you create what we call a network of support within this community. And that's called Islands of Resiliency. So what we basically know is that all these little nodes here that you see are the entropy. But if you build these Islands of Resiliency, they will make it slower or even sometimes stop it. But usually it just needs to slow down the entropy and by that you can help the system to find time to recover. So what is community resilience? Communities have the potential to function effectively and adapt successfully in the aftermath of disasters. Moreover, the first to respond to any disaster are normally inhabitants from the near vicinity. Facts, in disasters, family, friends, work, co-workers, neighbors, and strangers who happen to be in the area often conduct search and rescue activities and provide medical aid before police, fire, and other officials arrive. Okay, facts, unfortunately helpers and officials from outside the community sometimes find it hard to accept the fact that the community has strength, resources and abilities in short, that the local community is resilient. In the end, local forces are usually pushed aside, surrendering, surrendering control to people from outside the community, thus may make local people passive, and I just told you, that's the worst to make local people passive. So, what does it mean? What is community resilience? There is a wide consensus that says resilience is an ability or a process. Is it that or that? I believe it's a combination. Better conceptual and adaptability than as stability. The ability to what we call bounce and then bounce back. The ability to be flexible. 
A process linking a set of networks' adaptive capacities to a positive trajectory of functioning and adaptation in constituent population after a disturbance, or the ability of a community member to make, to take meaningful, deliberate, collective actions to remedy the impact of problem, including the ability to interpret the environment, intervene, and move on. There are many, many attempts in the past to define it. We have two kinds of, of uh, ways to look at it. We call it motivational versus hygienic factors. Motivational, it's what comes from the inside. Being a volunteer wanting to help, hygienic is what you expect to come from the outside. And it's very important to note that the more you expect help to come from the outside, the more passive you are. So you have to have some balance between the two. Okay. Six potential motivational components were defined in our study. Awareness of threat and or situations of distress. That means you have to be aware of it and plan for it. Need or drive to function despite the prevailing situation, the ability to be active. Internal focus of a locus of control, that means I can do it. I believe in my strengths. I believe in my community strengths, my friends and family. Believe in the ability to cope. Community cohesion, that's the community is not uh, fragmented. Um, and commitment, steadfastness and persistence. Drive to achieve objectives and demonstration of endurance. That means, in general, what we call leadership, that gives the people the hope that we can make it. I don't know if you remember, but Obama had a slogan, which actually made him to be the first black president of the United States. And you remember what it was? Three words, yeah, no, four, no. No, three, yes, we can. That's it. So when you have a leadership that is giving you a message that is easy to to absorb and mobilize you and put you to the to, to the cause, that's what we, we're talking about here. Okay, when you analyze the question the, the, the questionnaires that we gave, we we found that most of the activities that took place in the local councils were in the sphere of hygienic resilience. That means people were looking for things to come to them. Again, expecting everything to come from the government, from local authorities, and not in the motivational sphere, tra training and strengthening the, their ability, responsibility and commitment. So that's, I would say, a pitfall, because whenever government says, we will do the job, we will do the job, that will reduce the community ability to think, how are we helping ourselves? And go back to COVID. People believe that the health system will be there, that the government will provide food, will provide vaccine, will provide, will provide, will provide. The more you expect that to happen and the longer it takes for it to come, you get communities being depressed and people being affected. And that is something we have to take into consideration, especially following COVID as a major, major incident that can teach us so much. The relevant factors for en en engendering motivational resilience found in all areas of service, of survey. A sense of social cohesion, community involvement, and a sense of impacting the decision-making process. That means if people in the community feels that they are making difference, that they are part that people are taking care of or listening to them, it's very important. And motivational community, uh, motivational community resilience as defined by interviews. Feeling that a safe future is ensured for my children, very important, especially for young families and parents in general. They want to know that there is a future for their kids. Okay? A feeling that all members of the community care, or at least most, and from the availability of professional aid services in all spheres, that they want to know that there will be also professionals to support them. Okay. Back in 1980, we created this concept of called the model of community disaster management. It was a new concept. It was a new concept because it put together on the same table the mayor, the home front, the medical team, the security department, 
the logistic, etc. But first time community and psychology on the same table. So they will not only think about practicalities, but what's going on with the individual, the family and the community. Okay, so we developed basically multidisciplinary team for communities under stress and we basically move to local authority comprehensive responsibility that means you as a community is not only uh, 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 responsible for food, fuel, water and, and shelter but also to the mental health and to the services for the community. Okay, let me move on from that. And so what we came up is with a new model that is say, there is the state, government, local government, etc. There is the civilian network, that is business, private sector, media, etc. But you need to, in order to create what we call resilient community, that's what is needed to happen. So it should be combined. There should be a, a, a kind of a understanding that is back and forth so that people will feel that they are held, taken care of, etc. So basically, we believe that for national resilience strategy, we have to clear, to have clear and common principles such as national meaning and solidarity, leadership and management, defined roles and expectations, and of course, preparedness and learning. And here you can see that this is coming again, and all of that should be kind of cooperated and work together. Let's move on. Now, following this knowledge, we created the first, and I should say, the only statistically approved valued method to measure community resilience because it's a very complex issue how do you measure this kind of entities that doesn't always have a form or a format so what we came up following a big big study with about 20 contributors from different uh, universities who developed their own tools to create a common agreed upon tool and it's called the CRAM, the community, uh, sorry, let me say the community uh, resilience assessment measure or something like that. Sorry, I'm not remember all the, the uh, um, abbreviation, but it measures five factors. Collective efficacy, leadership, preparedness, attachment to place and social trust. And when we measured it, I will come back to what each of them means, we could see difference between different communities, you see? So for the collective communities in Israel, you have much more collective efficacy and much more uh, feel of attachment to place, but less of social trust, etc. So you can basically see where would you like to intervene? What would you like to strengthen for this community? We also found that if you do intervention and train people in these communities from one incident to the other they retain the knowledge they become more resilient they become more trained and they retain this knowledge despite the fact that there are differences in times as you can see it started in 2011 then 12 then 13 then 14 which follow that same community that we worked with and you can see there are ups and downs for all together when you come to 2014, you can see that they have a learning effect and they basically had a very good preparedness and community resilience. One of the major findings is a surprise, but not surprise for me. If you look at that, the most resilient group is the 66 to 75. Everywhere during COVID, they were the vulnerable group that you have to close down in homes and not let them out and don't let them uh, take anything. You remember the elderly? In all our studies, this is the more resilient group. And why? They have seen so many things in life. They are free to help. They feel that they have a mission. They want to keep their family uh, uh, together, alive, prosperous. And most of them are still very healthy. So they are a 
big resource of help that unfortunately in many communities are very neglected. If you organize them, if you train them, they are a major resource for your community. Now, being part of a voluntary body is also very, very good to create a sense of resilience. As you can see, the community response teams are better in their, uh, on their uh, community assessment scale on, and on their personal perceived scale of personal resilience. So what do we actually recommend? To instill a social community approach in all models of intervention following disaster, to assist in the creation of a professional psychosocial community team in the framework of a decision-making headquarters. So even those who are taking the decision will think about community, will think about if this crisis has happened and you have Muslim community and you have Christian community and you have Buddhist community, they will have different rituals of bereavement. They will behave differently. They need different times. For instance, Jews have to be buried within the next few hours. They shouldn't, in the Jewish uh, tradition, you shouldn't leave the, the dead to overnight. You have to bury them very quickly. But if you're talking about different cu uh, cultures, they have different rituals. So that's what I'm saying, to understand the kind of communities and st status, uh, 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 um, situations that you have, okay? Um, to assist in the defining and mapping of at-risk population, to know who might need more help, okay? To identify their needs, to develop responses and ap approaches for effective coping with a new situation and its implications. For instance, if you would have had good programs for the elderly who were put in isolation beforehand, many of them wouldn't feel so depressed and so left alone and so much out of contact with what's happening. With their fears of death, because anyway, when you're old, this is a question that comes to mind quite often. To strengthen the administrations, the reciprocal relationship and the cooperation between the social community system and the defense and economic, because usually they are working in their own tracks. The, to facilitate the smooth functioning of and circum sorry <coughs> of and circumstances permitting to assist in the preservation of the family, social community and organization framework throughout all stages of rehabilitation. That means if you can make these people stay within their vicinity, don't take them far away, and as soon as possible bring them back and try to keep them as part of the rehabilitation, they will feel sense of meaning and partnership in their recovery. To plan for such eventualities, the bulk of the responsibility should be transferred to the general population. Keep them part of it, not say, well, you stay aside, we'll do the job. Sources of local assistance and knowledge should be identified. There is a lot of resources in any community. Let me give you one more example. Haiti, it was a major earthquake with destructions of everything, including the presidential palace. We came there. There was nothing. Everything was devastated. Cholera. People f are really completely disabled. But there were children. So we said to ourselves, how can we help this community to start feeling that there are signs of life? So we identified an old retired school headmaster, woman in her late 60s, early 70s. And we asked her, would you be so kind and would you like to open a makeshift school? She said, yes. So we got some men to dig from the old school some desks and tables and, and chairs. And we created sheltered spaces with uh, present, you know, with, with, with cover. And um, we kind of called for volunteers to collect the kids together. The concept was that if the kids will be in a safe place, the families can take, or the parents can take care of some things to find a shelter for the night or something. But then we realized that we need to look for toilets. The whole sewage system completely destroyed. We saw so many men, men, uh, male men, of course, very, very depressed and uh, not mobile and uh, apathetic. And we said to this old lady, do you know any of them? She said, oh, a few of them were my, my, my students in the past. Said, 
Can you ask them to come and dig holes for toilets next to the school? You should have seen the impact of a small intervention. There was a school, children were coming, they were singing, they were playing, they were studying a little bit, but the fact that there was kind of a circle of, of, of recovery and a sign that life is coming to some sort of normalcy created a, a kind of a, a sphere of hope in this small community. So it's just to show you that there are resources, but you need to look for them. If you don't look for them, you think everything is destroyed. To recruit the mass media to help to strengthen the, co uh, the coping efforts, because mass media is always focusing on drama and trauma. Make sure they not only focus on that, but on the small victorious stories, small things that help the people to feel we are making it, we're not complete failure. And so, I will show you what are these uh, four ele five elements. Leadership means Officials in my town routinely demonstrate leadership ability. That's one of the questions. The municipal authority, regional council in my town functions well in emergency situations. Family and community preparedness. In my town there are sufficient public protection facilities or my town is organized for emergency situations. For the attachment to place, which is very important, uh, aspect is I feel sense of belonging to my town or to my community. And the residents of my town wish to continue to live together. Social trust is the relationship between the various groups in my town are good or there is a trust among the residents of my town. And collective efficacy is I can depend on people in my town to come to my assistance in a crisis and I believe in the ability of my community to, rec to, rec to overcome an emergency. So these are the five elements that we found to be very predictive of community resilience. And so with that, I give you the time to ask questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.